Molt bona tarda a totes les persones que ens acompanyeu en aquest acte d'investidura de la professor Dame Wendy Hall com a doctora honoris causa per la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya, la UOC. Amb la vostra assistència doneu una rellevància major en aquesta cerimònia que significa el reconeixement a aquesta doctora en matemàtiques, actualment catedràtica de ciència computacional, vicerectora adjunta de compromís internacional de la Universitat de Southampton, directora executiva del Web Science Institute i directora gerent del Web Science Trust. Una salutació també cordial a les persones que segueixen la retransmissió en directe d'aquest acte que en fem a través del canal YouTube de la de la nostra universitat. Hem començat amb música, una música molt del gust de la nostra homenatjada amb l'icònic Let it be dels Beatles, una cançó que forma part, podríem dir, del nostre imaginari col·lectiu, comú, i que ha interpretat el violoncel·lista nascut als Estats Units i format al Conservatori Superior de Música del Liceu, Miquel Quinan Fuentes. La seva invitació respon a la col·laboració estreta que mantenen la UOC amb la Fundació Pau Casals, amb la qual comparteixen projectes i valors com la càtedra Pau Casals i que enguany té una rellevància major atès que s'escau el 50 aniversari de la mort del mestre Pau Casals, el mestre violoncel·lista català, ambaixador de la nostra cultura arreu del món. Sense més preàmbuls, tenen la paraula els doctors Daniel Riera, director dels Estudis d'Informàtica, Multimèdia i Telecomunicació i també director del programa d'Enginyeria Informàtica de la UOC, així com el doctor David Mejías, director de l'Internet Indistinagrari Institut i catedràtic dels estudis d'informàtica, multimèdia i telecomunicació de la UOC. Ambdós són els autors d'aquesta glosa, altrament coneguda com a l'audatio de la professor Dame Wendy Hall. Sisplau. President Planell, professor Dame Wendy Hall, colleagues, friends. At the beginning of the future, there were two young women, Mary Shelley and Ada Lovelace. This is the beginning of the book, 12 Bytes, How Artificial Intelligence Will Change the Way We Live and Love, by Janet Winterson, one of my favorite writers. Ada Lovelace, born in 1815, is nowadays a reference for many girls who will take part in the design of the, of the present and the future. References are crucial to change the world, but only a few people become references. Today we are lucky, today we are lucky to have one of them among us, Professor Dame Wendy Hall. Already shows us, most of, the, uh, most of us, the way to follow. History will include her in the exclusive list of people who not only built a new world, a better world, but also inspired many others to do so. The World Economic Forum has calculated that by 2133, the gap in technological vocations between women and men will disappear. Yes, I said 2133. Scientific evidence found by research groups like Gentic, the group in the IN3, describes a list of reasons why girls around the age of nine or 10 years decide not to, not to engage in scientific technological careers. They have the skills, they have the competences, and usually the vocation to go into these fields. But they finally change their minds. Professor Hall is already a reference who, who, who can help those girls to stick to their dreams. The same as my fellow women in the work tech department, let me thank them for overcoming all the difficulties and being an essential part of our team. Professor Hall has shown her concern about this fact, this fact often and she insists on the importance sorry, of inspiring young girls with visions of the wonderful careers they can have and how they can help society if they embark on careers in computing or IT. And she adds, currently, digital systems and solutions are being designed by a small subset of the people of the planet, and they are for everybody. It's so important that we have diversity of workforce in this area. Thus, to have this diversity in computing and rich equity, we need references like Professor Wendy Hall. But how does somebody become an academic reference? What is the magic recipe? Which are the, ing the secret ingredients? 
Well, I'm terrible in, in the kitchen, but let me try to guess. First of all, it needs motivation, but not a normal one. A motivation raised to the level of passion. A few, a few weeks ago, we were lucky to have in this same building Professor Katsuhiko Nishi. He was the creator of MSX computers in the 80s. Many of us got in love with computing thanks to one of those. In the case of Professor Hall, she was born in London, so she first became interested in programming with, when she tried out a Commodore Pet, which was more common in the, in the UK. She taught herself the early programming based, uh, language basic, language co-designed by uh, the American Catholic religious sister, Mary Kenneth Keller. Till that moment, uh, Professor Hall was not passionate about computing, but then she realized how computers could be used in education, particularly when it became apparent that it would be possible to interact with graphics, photos, audio, and even video. That was the seed which has been growing and growing. And if I'm not wrong, I think it is still going on. <laughs> I hope. The second ingredient is knowledge. A degree and a PhD in mathematics and a master's degree in computing are the foundations for the career of, of Professor Hall. With this strong scientific or technical base and with a special sensitivity for using technology to connect and, and improve people's lives, she has broken down many walls. As my colleague David will explain later, she has not, she has not kept her research and transfer in one sphere but has contributed to the creation of knowledge in areas like mathematics, artificial intelligence, the web, hypermedia, or ethics on artificial intelligence. She has supervised more than 40 PhD theses, led a number of research projects, and published more than 400 scientific communications. The third ingredient is leadership. Professor Hall has led too many projects to name them all uh, now. So let me choose some of them. She's professor of computer science and vice president of, the international, of international engagement at the University of Southampton. She's also the executive dire director of the Web Science Institute and the manager, manager, managing director of the Web Science Trust, which she founded in 2006, along with her colleague and honorary doctor also by the work, Tim Berners-Lee. Sorry, sir, Tim Berners-Lee. She is chair of the Ada Lovelace Institute, the British Council Education Advisory Group, and the European Union Commission's IST Advisory Group. Furthermore, she has been president of the British Computer Society and president of the Association for Computer Machinery, which is the World Association of Computer Scientists. The fourth ingredient is altruism. Professor Hall has shown hers in several ways. Her willingness to collaborate with so many people in so many different projects and fields is highly remarkable. Furthermore, she has accepted a number of requests to be expert advisor on artificial intelligence and ethics. The UK government is very lucky to have Professor Hall always ready to help. And we are very grateful, of course, that she was a member of the WOC's Scientific Commission for Research. And as I said before, we cannot forget his insistence on using technology, be it artificial intelligence, data science, the web, or multimedia, among others, to improve people's lives. Her research is currently focused on issues that should concern us all. The future of the web and the internet, and topical issues such as internet governance, cybersecurity, privacy, and trust. She's also implementing robust and interpretable machine learning systems co-driven by data and knowledge, and establishing a collaborative platform to enable the development of socially beneficial autonomous systems. And the last of the ingredients in my personal list is recognition. Again, I will need to make a selection due to the length of the list. Professor Hall has been assessed several times as one of the most powerful and influential women in the UK and the world, and has received several awards and recognitions, including the Suffrage Science Award by the London Institute of Medical Sciences, a distinguished fellowship by the British Computer Society, the Outstanding Contribution Award by the ICM, the Association for Computing Machinery, and the IAQ 
Engineering, for, for Engineering the Future Award. And to conclude this highly summarized list of awards, she was appointed Regius Professor of Computer Science at the University of Southampton, and finally named Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> Hall has received honorary degrees from up to 16 prestigious universities, 17 from today. She was offered a number of talks. She has offered a number of talks and keynotes at national and international conferences and meetings, having spoken at the Royal Society of Edinburgh and at the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow, among others. Well, as you see, such as Ada Lovelace reference is present two centuries later in the schools, Wendy Holtz will be in 2133. Thus, to get an idea of the importance of Professor Hall in the field of computing, the easiest thing to do is to project the importance of someone like Lovelace to the present day. And let me finish my part with a personal comment. My four years old daughter is called Ada, after Ada Lovelace. Perhaps if she had been born in the 22nd century, we would have, we would have called her Wendy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your brilliant description of a selection of the impressive achievements of Professor Dame Wendy Hall in the field of science and computing. Now, uh, let me focus on the most relevant contributions of Professor Hall to science in general and computing in particular. During her career, Professor Hall has shown an extraordinary ability to anticipate and address emerging issues and challenges. Uh, from the development of the World Wide Web and the Semantic Web to the design of intelligent systems and the study of the societal impact of technology. Professor Hall is known for her visionary thinking and groundbreaking research, which has pushed the boundaries of what is possible in the field of computer science. Professor Hall's uh, focus of research is the study of the World Wide Web as a socio-technical system by exploring how the web and its users impact society as well as how society shapes the development of the web. By taking an interdisciplinary approach to the study of the web, Professor Hall seeks to gain a deeper understanding of the complex interactions between technology, people, and society. Now, I will go back to 2006 when Sir Tim Berners-Lee, Professor Hall, and some other colleagues published one of the most relevant and seminal works of our time, entitled A Framework for uh, Web Science. Let me read a short, frag a short fragment of the introductory section of that paper. The web needs to be studied and understood, and it needs to be engineered. At the micro scale, web is an infrastructure of artificial languages and protocols. It is a piece of engineering, but the linking philosophy that governs the web and its use in communication result in emerging properties at the macro scale. And of course, the, web, the web's use in communication is part of a wider system of human interactions governed by conventions and laws. The various levels at which web technologies interact with human society mean that interdisciplinarity is a firm requirement of web science. Such an interdisciplinary research agenda, able to drive the web development in, so, uh, in socially and scientifically useful ways, is not yet visible and needs to be created. This is just one among the many references to interdisciplinarity that can be found across Professor Hall's works. Here at our university, interdisciplinarity has always been one of our fundamental principles. The Internet Interdisciplinary Institute, founded by Professor Manuel Castells in 1999, is, is one of the first few examples of the preeminence of interdisciplinarity at work. Very recently, 25 years after the creation of the AIN3, we have been able to inaugurate the WOC's interdisciplinary hub 
for research and innovation, aiming at fostering collaboration between researchers and teams with expertise as diverse as social sciences, computer engineering, digital arts, education, or health, among others. During the official inauguration of this hub, the president of the university, Professor Planell, made the following statement. In this new space, we will be fostering excellent interdisciplinary frontier research to provide solutions in three key areas in which we have renowned expertise, e-learning, e-health, and the network society. We want research to remain a cornerstone of our university for the next 25 years. It is clear where some of the roots of the research pillars of the work from, come from. There is an obvious path starting from the early days of web science and moving forward step by step, link by link, until today's work interdisciplinary hub. It's now mandatory to recall a very famous quote attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. If I have seen farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Thus, if we, the work research community, can bring out some new knowledge in areas like e-learning, e-health, and the network society, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants like Professor Dan, Dane Wendy Hall. Now let me add a few more words about the relevance of interdisciplinarity and why it is essential in today's research. First, interdisciplinary research is crucial in solving problems that require diverse perspectives, approaches, and expertise. These complex pro problems are often multidimensional and cannot be tackled by a single discipline. For example, climate change is a complex issue that requires knowledge from skills uh, from various fields, such as environmental sciences, physics, economics, and social sciences. Second, Interdisciplinary research also, help, also helps break down disciplinary boundaries and silos, which can limit creativity and innovation. When researchers coming from different fields collaborate, they bring together different ways of thinking, problem, solvi problem solving, and communicational skills, which can lead to new and innovative ideas. By working together, researchers can also learn from each other and gain a broader understanding of their own uh, discipline and its connections to other fields. Third, interdisciplinary research is essential in addressing the major challenges of our time, such as the global health, energy, and environmental issues. These challenges are too complex and, and too urgent to be considered in the scope of a single discipline. Interdisciplinary research brings together the best minds from different fields to work towards common goals and solutions. It allows, it allows us to harness the full range of knowledge and expertise from across academia and beyond, and to engage with diverse stakeholders, including policymakers, industry, and citizens, to achieve the most meaningful impact. However, interdisciplinarity also brings out some difficulties. A paper published in Nature in 2015 describes a very successful interdisciplinary adventure in Melbourne, Australia, joining researchers from social sciences and biophysical engineering. And a paragraph in that article reads as follows. We witness biophysical researchers accusing social scientists of poor rigor and of spending too much time conceptualizing problems without exploring and offering solutions. Conversely, social scientists were often frustrated that biophysical researchers were too focused on solutions, uh, reductively overlooking the wider societal implications of their proposed approach. I bet that whoever who has been involved in interdisciplinary research uh, joining engineering and so social sciences and humanities will, will feel a close connection with this Australian experience. And here is where uh, Professor Hall has excelled during her successful career, 
by creating a collaborative and inclusive environment that bridges the gaps between seemingly disparate fields. Her visionary leadership and expertise have enabled diverse teams to work together seamlessly, leveraging the strengths and the insights of each discipline to achieve truly innovative and impactful results. Professor Hall's dedication to interdisciplinary research is an inspiration to all those who seek to break down boundaries and forge new paths uh, in their own activity. Now I will move to highlight a few of the contributions of Professor, Professor Hall to other relevant current issues. Professor Hall is widely recognized for her work in the field of the semantic web, which is a vision for the future of the web, of the web where information is not just presented as text and graphics, but also machine readable and interoperable. The goal of the semantic web is to enable computers to understand the meaning of the web content, making it possible to automatically integrate and use the data from different sources. Professor Hall has worked on various projects related to the semantic web, including the development of web ontology language and the Semantic Web Science Association, which promotes research and education in that field. While Professor Hall's research is primarily focused on the study of the web as an entity, she's also in actively involved in other research topics, including artificial intelligence and data science. As a researcher and practitioner, Professor Hall is deeply invested in the future of the internet. Her work aims to shed light on the complex and ever-evolving relationships between technology, people, and society, and shows a dedicated commitment to exploring the ethical and societal implications of the technological de development, including, as my colleague Daniel just mentioned, the internet governance, cybersecurity, privacy, and trust, aiming at the development of more ethical and responsible and sustainable technologies. It is with great admiration that we thank Professor Hall for her extraordinary contributions to the fields of computing and science. Her visionary thinking, groundbreaking research, and dedicated commitment to ethical technological development have inspired countless researchers and practitioners, and her advocacy for a greater diversity and inclusion in these fields has made a lasting impact. Professor Hall's legacy will continue to shape and inspire the next generation of researchers and innovators, and we are honored to have had the opportunity to learn from her exceptional leadership and expertise. Thank you very much. Moltes gràcies als professors Daniel Riera i David Mejías per aquesta laudatio. Sens dubte els mèrits impressionants els hem resseguit tot seguit. Ara té la paraula el doctor Pere Fabra, secretari general de la UOC, i farà la lectura de l'acord del Consell de Govern de la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya, pel qual s'acorda nomenar a la doctora Honoris Causa, a la professora d'AIM, Wendy Hall. Bé, acord del Consell de Direcció de la UOC de data 23 de març de 2020, 2020 pel qual s'atorga el títol de doctora honoris causa a la doctora Wendy Hall. Vista la proposta efectuada per la Direcció dels Estudis d'Informàtica, Multimèdia i Telecomunicació, vist el reglament d'honors i distincions de la Universitat i un cop examinada i avaluada la documentació corresponent, el Consell de Direcció, actuant per delegació del Consell de Govern, acorda atorgar el títol de doctora honoris causa per la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya a la professora Wendy Hall pels mèrits que es detallen a continuació. Per la seva excel·lència acadèmica, contrastada en els camps de la intel·ligència artificial, la web semàntica i la ciència del web, àrea creada per ella mateixa, Àmbits, tots ells, en els que ha estat pionera amb les seves valuoses contribucions als sistemes multiagent, sistemes intel·ligents i les tecnologies multi- i hipermèdia, fins i tot abans de la creació del World Wide Web. Per la seva visió inclusiva de la tecnologia, amb un fort èmfasi en la interdisciplinarietat 
i la cooperació necessària entre àmbits de coneixement. Pel seu valor humà, visible en la seva aposta per utilitzar la tecnologia, i més concretament el web, en benefici de les persones. Per ser referent i líder en la lluita per la igualtat de gènere en la tecnologia i per la reducció de la segregació horitzontal en aquest àmbit. Barcelona, 23 de març del 2020. Gràcies a Pere Fabra. Ha costat, però hi hem arribat, que és el més important. Procedim tot seguit al lliurament del títol de doctora Honoris Causa, així com el lliurament de la medalla de la Universitat que s'atorga a la doctora Hall. Serà el rector de la UOC, el doctor Josep Anton Planell, qui farà entrega de la medalla a la professor Dame Wendy Hall i seguidament li lliurarà el diploma acreditatiu en tant que doctora Honoris Causa. Dr. Planell, will we do the honors of presenting professor Dame Wendy Hall with... Please proceed.
Reteniu bé els seus noms, Saba Nova, hem escoltat novament Miquel Quina en Fuentes al violoncel en aquesta ocasió i juntament amb Daimar López al violí interpretant aquesta passacàglia Henden Halvorsen, una composició del director d'orquestra i violinista noruec Johan Halvorsen, inspirada en un tema del genial compositor barroc. La música ens porta al moment més esperat. Now it's time to hear from Professor Daim Wendy Hall. Welcome, congratulations. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Moses Grasses. Oh, that's it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Though uh, it, It's really quite uncomfortable sitting there listening to all these amazing things that you think I've done. Um, I, claim, I lay claim to some of them, but thank you. You're, it's hugely, a huge honour, and I'm deeply flattered, um, both for what you've given me, but also the amazing publicity. I'm a media tart. <laughs> and the publicity beforehand, that lovely video that your comms team made is just fantastic. Um, and it's lovely to be reunited with people I've met before and to make new friends. It's lovely to be back. And I do want to say on record thank you to Manuel Castells because he's the reason that I came here. He's the reason Tim got his honorary degree and he's the reason IN3 exists. And, and it was a pleasure to be here as the, on the advisory board. Um, what was it 10 years ago, you said? We were, something like that. So I also want to say thank you for Let It Be. That was a beautiful, beautiful version of it. And for those that don't know, somebody did their research incredibly well. There's a very famous BBC uh, radio programme called Desert Island Dis, and they have sort of famous people on, you know, Z-list celebrities sometimes like me, and uh, you have to pick your eight favourite pieces of music that you would take to a desert island with you, and then you have to pick your favourite of the favourites. And Let It Be was my favourite of the favourites. 
And I'm, I'm a child of the swinging 60s in London. I was born in London at that time, very heady days. And I was a huge Beatles fan and I still adore Paul McCartney. Um, so I don't, there's a lot of things I can skip actually because you've read out a lot of my CV. As, um, as Daniel said, I studied mathematics. Actually, I wanted to study medicine, but my headmistress wouldn't let me. This was 1969, I was choosing my A-level subjects and, and she said, to, I can hear her to this day, she said, Wendy, medicine is not a career for women. And in 1969 it wasn't. There were very different days back then. And I think she said to me, Wendy, you will go to Cambridge and read mathematics uh, because you're good at mathematics. And actually, well, I rebelled and didn't apply to Oxford or Cambridge. That's another whole story. But I did read mathematics because I, it was a natural for me to do. And I think in retrospect, she was probably right with her advice. I hated her at the time. And I still wish I'd been a, a, a doctor, but a medic, but in many ways. But actually, I think my career has developed further and faster as a mathematician than it could have done as a medic because it, it was my natural skill. And it was, a, um, a, at the time, a very... Uh, when I went to university in the 70s, we were just on the cusp of the computer revolution. But I hated computers at university. <laughs> it was all punch card and paper tape and Fortran. And um, once I knew I could give it up, I uh, gave it up, never knowing I'd be back. But there weren't many good jobs for mathematicians in those days. It was a time of cutbacks. And um, I uh, was teaching maths in a higher education college, but I wanted to be in a research environment. And um, but my boss in the maths department said, well, you're, you, 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 know, you must be able to do programming. We want a programming course. So as one of you said, I took a Commodore pet home for the summer and taught myself basic. Now, Edgar Dijkstra, who you might know, who was a famous, he invented the Pascal programming language, a famous computer scientist. He, his famous, he talked about all the bad things about programming languages, and he, his famous phrase about BASIC was, if your BASIC is your, that's capital B-A-S-I-C, right? if BASIC is your first programming language, then you are mentally mutilated for life. <laughs> and he was so right. I, I have never been a programmer. In fact, my PhD was, I've never enjoyed programming. I can do it, I've taught it, but it's not anything I do as a hobby. Um, uh, I've absolutely <laughs> worshipped the people who can do it very well. And um, uh, what was I going to say with that one? But I do think that because my PhD was in pure mathematics, it was algebraic topology, I think in a very abstract way. And I apply that skill to computing. And a lot of computer scientists get very deep into the woods and the detail of programming. Sorry, very into the trees and the detail of programming. They don't see up and look at the big picture. And I think that's my part of my skill is that I understand it enough to know what we can do today, but I abstract out of it to think about where this might lead us tomorrow. And I think that's, that's part of what's been the skill. So it certainly applied. Um, when I went back to Southampton um, as a computer scientist, I applied for a job and surprisingly got it. Um, I'd done my first, first degrees there, and I had done a master's course in um, computer science a part-time, I already had my PhD, but I thought, well, I'm, if I'm going to do computing, if I'm going to go that way, then I really need to be able to understand it. And my project was on intelligent tutoring systems, and this is in 1986. I did write some prologue code, um, and it was, you know, like intelligent tutoring systems in the 1980s were science fiction. Um, we begin to see how we can build them today, but this... So I, I was an AI professor, researcher from the word go, in a way. But as one of you said, <laughs> I forget which one, the David and Daniel show this is, um, the, uh, I was inspired very early on in my um, career. It was actually because we had a set of videotapes to teach Pascal programming. And it was a fabulous way to teach. You got the videotape, it was a book that uh, the person who wrote the book about how to learn how to do Pascal programming had produced a set of videotapes and he had a guitar. I always remember it, and he used to play the guitar and then do the lesson. And all we had to do was put the videotape in and sit back and let the students watch it. I thought, this is, this is good. 
Um, and then video, video discs. I don't know how many of you remember the video discs, the 12 inch laser discs, they came out and you could actually interact with them. Fabulous things. And I began to realize that we could have text and pictures and video and sound on a computer screen and interact with it. Now in those days that was science fiction. Little did I realize that during my career, I'd be able to do all that on something that fits in your pocket or your handbag, right? It's all on the mobile phone now, but or other devices, but it was science fiction. You had to write the drivers to get the videos to play and then interact with them. And we got very good at that at Southampton, or my team did. It, it wasn't even called multimedia then. It was just called video discs, and we did it in education. And I started looking at this hypermedia stuff that this chap called Ted Nelson had invented in the 70s, this idea that you might use computers to help you find information that could be in some sort of electronic format. There was no digital video at the time. That didn't exist. This was all before digital anything exists. The video was analog, and we had to convert it and play with it, so it was all very clunky. But I could absolutely see in the future, um, I'm still struggling with the fact that in 2033, someone might call their child Wendy. That was a really clever little trick there. Um, that the, the, you know, when we were doing this stuff, it was just pressed, this technology was going to arrive. And I could see that when it did, it was going to change the world. Um, so we started designing the system that became microcosm, and you can read the books and the papers about it. It was a much better system than the World Wide Web. <laughs> but it lacked two or three problems, things that... We ran it with proprietary standards on a standalone IBM PC, which could have been linked to a network or wasn't, and, and we started to set up, we set up a commercial company to sell it. We got quite a lot of investment, actually, for a while. But at exactly the same time, this Tim Berners-Lee person was inventing the World Wide Web, and the, the, it was much simpler hypertext, which was part of its beauty at the beginning. And he made the standards for you know, HTML, HTTP, open and universal and gave it away, said everybody use it, which is what made it take off. Um, we're now living with the, that decision <laughs> because its openness has also been set the seeds for the problems we have today in how we manage it. But that's another whole story. And, um, you know, the, the thing about doing this work, I met him first at... Um, the European Hypertext Conference in 1990. He put the world first website up that Christmas. We went to San Antonio the next year for the Hypertext Conference in San Antonio in 91, where Tim first demoed the web in the US using his own credit card to pay for the modem. There was no internet in the hotel then. We were demoing Microcosm, just down from him in the demo room. And outside there was a tequila fountain. So who cared about the demos? They were all out there drinking margaritas. <laughs> But, I, and, but that is pictures of Tim, actually. That was the first time he... Demo, and the first time I saw him demo it, and I looked at it and I thought, well, there's nothing new here. Our hypertext links are much more interesting than his. But, you know, so you shouldn't believe anything I say, really. And the other thing to, to make the point about was that we were talking about interdisciplinary work. When, um, when you start something new, especially you know, when you're an academic... There are no journals and no conferences for you to publish in or go and talk. You have to create those as well. So that's why we get called pioneers, and it's incredibly risky because you're generally judged as an academic on the merit of where you publish, which conferences you speak at. So if you're starting all that yourself, this is why it gets, it's highly risky to do that. Um, and... Uh, the um, other thing about it is I was actually told by my bosses at Southampton, the professors at Southampton, or one of them anyway, in public, that there was no future for me, either in computer science or at Southampton, if I didn't stop playing around with videos and get back to writing programming languages or operating systems or real computer science. Well, I got a lot more honours than he did. Anyway... But it is hard. I mean, you really, you don't do this thing, these things lightly. Um, and I've done it several times in my career, as you've alluded to, and I guess that's a, I'm a serial pioneer, I suppose. But anyway, <laughs> I, um, uh, 
I got the accolade of being the first female professor of engineering at Southampton. There wasn't another one for another 10 years. You know, it was quite, there weren't many of us around. There were other female professors of computer science and engineering in other, other universities, but there weren't that many of us. And in 1996, I got a very prestigious um, EPSLC, that was our uh, funding agency, Engineering Physical Sciences. I got a fellowship. They're very prestigious. They only gave three a year. Um, across the whole of the sciences and engineering. I got a six-year fellowship. And it, the interesting thing about it is that um, I, think I, was, I think I was the first computer scientist to get one. I'm not sure about that, but one of the first. And the proposal was to integrate hypermedia search, which in those days we called information retrieval, and databases, right, to sort of create a common theory of those types of information management systems and my idea was to use multi-agent and knowledge-based systems to do that. So um, I got the fellowship. There was actually no mention of the web in that fellowship, and I wrote that proposal in 1995. Even though I was working with Tim, I knew about the web, I just didn't see it as that much part of the future. It was amazing now you can't imagine that you could do that. But anyway, we had by the end of the fellowship, I'd changed, I'd had a lot more on the web. And uh, we developed Microcosm, a distributed link system, and um, Nick, professors Nick Jennings and Nigel Shabbolt came to Southampton. Nick was the agents, Nigel was knowledge-based systems. And we were quite a bit, a fantastic team for the 10, 12 years we were together at Southampton. And that's when I got interested in the semantic web work and I realized that the Microcosm system that I'd, we developed, I always say we, <laughs> um, that we developed was, uh, had the links were triples and they were separate from the document. Tim embedded his links in the documents. I always told him that was the wrong thing to do. I think I was right, but in, <laughs> to get it, make it simple and take off, that was what was, hit. That's, that was the, the right thing at the time. But our links were triples and separate and that was very prescient of what the semantic web was, the, the web of linked data, as you said earlier. And then we started thinking about, this was about 2005, why didn't Semantic Web take off? This has been Tim's idea from the very beginning, back in the 90s, that this was the, the web wouldn't achieve its full potential unless it was a web of data as well as of links. And we started looking back at how the web, what had made the web take off? Because by 2005, it was very dominant. The social media, Facebook didn't exist then, None of the, Google was there, but none of the social media companies were there when we started thinking about the web as a socio-technical system. We had to think about it from the point of view of what people did with it and how that influenced the development of the technology. And we started talking about the important things were gonna be privacy, security, and trust, and cyber, cyber security, and so on. And we started writing the framework for web science. Um, and that was another sort of, um, in another new discipline that I started to get involved with or develop, create, or rather an interdiscipline, as I sometimes like to call it. And um, we, yeah, well, you know the story. You can read about it. We set up the Web Science Trust. And then I went off into my management. I went to be head of department, um, ACM president, dean. I was still doing the research, but not, I didn't create any new, new disciplines in doing that. I was managing things keeping the web science thing going very much. And when I finished being dean, I was very relieved to finish being dean, and I, uh, I became executive director of the Web Science Institute, which was the social technical group, the interdisciplinary research institute we set up at Southampton to focus on web science. And then something came out of left field, a phone call from number 10 Downing Street uh, in 2017, I thought I was happily heading for quieter times, doing what I loved. And um, the phone call came and said, would you, would you write a report about artificial intelligence? Um, we want you to co-write it with someone from industry, and we want it to be focused on gr econ economic growth and the growth of jobs. Because the rhetoric at the time was, well, AI is going to eat all our jobs and we want something that's more positive, we want to think about what the UK should be doing to make, take advantage of artificial intelligence. So this is 2017, uh, when the hype was all of machine learning. You know, beating the chess players, beating the Go players, all that sort of hype. 
Anyway, cut a long story short, I said yes. We had to produce that in four months. But they liked it. We had a lot of help from Number 10 to do that and steer it. We became part of... It was the David... No, it was the Theresa May government. So we were already Brexited. Um, it was the Theresa May government. They were looking for something positive to do. And... Uh, uh, we became part of the government's industrial strategy. We became a sector deal in 2018, which made, made, meant they could give us money. We set up in the UK the Office for Artificial Intelligence, the AI Council that advised the Office of Artificial Intelligence, which I'm still a member of. And um, basically, I had a new career at 65, which is very interesting. Um, we drew up a roadmap. We helped the um, government develop a new AI strategy in 2021. Um, and I'm now very excited about the new AI regulation paper that's coming out this month, and we will see how it... I'm going to say... What's the right verb? How it relates to the EU AI Act. <laughs> Shall we just leave it there? It's very different. Um, we'll, see, we'll see how... They both have their strengths and weaknesses, so... So now I live my life at 35,000 feet. Well, not during COVID, obviously. I mean, I can't believe the date that you passed 23rd of March 2020 when you awarded me the honorary degree. That was like exactly when we went into lockdown, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, but post-lockdown, I'm, I'm, I live my life at 35,000 feet. I, I get to do a lot of traveling, which I love. I advise a lot of governments, a lot of companies on the future of the internet, AI, data governance, ethics, regulation, and encouraging more women into STEM. And I feel that just by doing this, I'm sort of helping that movement, although there's so much work to do in that area. I wrote a book with my colleague, Kieran O'Hara. He was the lead author. He did, wrote most of the 400 pages, but it's our joint effort about the future of the internet. It's called Four Internets, and if you want to know what they are, you've got to read the book or come to a talk about it. Uh, published by OUP, it's Data, Geopolitics, and the Governance of Cyberspace, and it's, how, it's about how the internet has stayed technically open and the, we still have the same internet we had 50 years ago. The TCP IP that Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn, the standards they developed for the internet, is, it's 50 years old next year. And it stayed up and running during COVID when we all piled onto it, which is a huge testament to the pioneers who designed that system. And, of course, Tim, who built the web on top of that, it all kept running so that we could talk to our families, carry on working, listen to what the government told us to do, all those, all those things. And, um, you know, I'm passionate about this stuff still. As I said, the Internet's 50 years old next year, and we've got to think about the next 50 years and the future of the internet and the future of the world with artificial intelligence are completely intertwined. Um, so when I talk about the geopolitics of the internet, that's going to be true for AI as well. The way our governments regulate AI will determine our futures very much, and it's going to be very different in the US, Europe, China, and other emerging nations. <laughs> we desperately need diversity. We need interdisciplinary skills and expertise. And those are two of the things that I see flourishing here at WOC. I've learned to say it's WOC. And I've learned to say, you never walk alone. Thank you. Professor Dame, uh, Wendy Hall, ara ja sí, doctora honoris causa per la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. Enfilem el tram final i arribem, és clar que sí, de mans del doctor Josep Anton Planell, rector de la Universitat. Les seves paraules seran el preludi a la interpretació del Gaudiamus Igitur, un cant que la tradició ha convertit, podríem dir, en aquest himne universal de l'Acadèmia. Amb ell arribarem al final. Rector, sisplau, quan pugui. Professor Dame Wendy Hall, uh, direct, uh, I'll, I will do it in Catalan. Uh, uh, 
amb directors, padrins, rectora, vicerrectores, vicerrector, professores, professors, síndica, amigues i amics. La distància que separa una ocurrència esbojarrada d'una bona idea pot ser molt subtil. Sovint el seu èxit o fracàs depèn de les condicions donades, ja que aquestes poden determinar si allò que s'intueix amb potència esdevé realitat. La creació de la UOC ara fa 27 anys va ser una idea feliç perquè va ser una idea puntual. Com sabem, la puntualitat implica arribar en el moment just. No val avançar-se ni endarrerir-se, sinó ser-hi a temps, ser precís. Perquè quan la sincronia entre idea i context es dona, el temps s'accelera i el paradigma canvia, i això és una revolució. En el cas de l'educació online, internet, una internet encara a les Bassaroles, va permetre transformar la relació entre estudiant i professor. Va facilitar la superació de barreres de tota mena per accedir a l'educació superior i va convertir en present la formació al llarg de la vida. Aquesta revolució educativa va beneficiar-se d'unes condicions donades on, entre d'altres, la nostra nova honoris causa va tenir-hi un paper capdalt. Com han glossat a bastament els professors Riera i Mejías, la doctora Wendy Hall ha seguit sent puntual i crucial amb una recerca que ha fet avançar les fronteres de la computació i de la intel·ligència artificial. I alhora ha estat present i decisiva en els diferents debats entorn al món digital, tant des del punt de vista tecnològic com de les seves repercussions socials. Conscient que, si aquestes eines tan poderoses han de canviar el món i de fer-les tan canviant, paga la pena esforçar-nos perquè el canvi vagi a millor. D'aquí la importància d'obrir la tecnologia a tothom, de potenciar el seu ús en favor de l'equitat i de conjurar-nos per no deixar ningú enrere. Amb paraules de la nostra convidada, i cito, si no disposes d'una força de treball diversa, hi ha més possibilitats de reproduir biaixos i que no funcioni per grans sectors de la població. El fil d'aquesta reflexió de la doctora Hall i de la seva trajectòria m'agradaria reflexionar, encara que sigui breument, sobre tres trets que el meu parer caracteritzen i caracteritzaran la bona recerca, que és el mateix que dir la Universitat de demà. En primer lloc, l'assumpció que la xarxa té un efecte multiplicador pel coneixement. La xarxa entesa com les relacions entre nodes de creació, generació, difusió i intercanvi de coneixement en el sentit més ampli, d'hospitals a universitats, de l'administració i les empreses als professionals, de la xarxa entesa com a malla definida per la tecnologia quan aquesta es posa al servei d'una ciència oberta i d'un intercanvi en condicions d'igualtat, i de la xarxa entesa com aquell vincle, no sempre visible, però com l'efecte papallona provoca que arran d'unes recerques pioneres a cavall dels Estats Units i a Gran Bretanya, avui puguem celebrar els 25 anys de la creació dels nostres estudis d'informàtica, multimèdia i telecomunicació. En segon lloc, voldria destacar la necessitat d'aprendre, no per les respostes d'avui, sinó per les preguntes de demà. Com va escriure el filòsof escocès Alastair McIntyre, l'educació s'ha de projectar al futur i s'ha de valorar en funció del seu impacte posterior. Ell ho exemplificava tot dient que allò rellevant no eren les notes obtingudes, sinó els llibres que aquests graduats llegirien en 5, 10 o 20 anys. 
Si substituïm llibres de la citació i els actualitzem per feines, competències, preguntes, tecnologies, etc., s'entendrà molt millor. I en tercer lloc, en tercer i darrer lloc, vull incorporar una mirada política. Una mirada política que es comprometi amb un món digital més democràtic, segur i obert, per així treballar pel procés i la capacitació. Una mirada política que aposti per una ciència oberta, interdisciplinària i humanista, per així, i en benefici de la majoria, incorporar tot el talent possible. I aquí cal fer menció específica del talent femení. Ho defineix molt millor que jo, la nostra futura rectora, en un text encara inèdit on demana una ciència que es posa al servei dels reptes globals fent-ne de la seva complexitat virtut i una ciència que l'incloure la dona com a subjecte, objecte i verb científic en garanteix la globalitat de les seves oportacions. Oi que sí? I acabo. Xarxa, futur, femení. Tres substantius que defineixen la trajectòria de la nostra honoris causa. Com a referent en la promoció del talent femení a les estem. Com a activista per una web més democràtica, segura i oberta. I com a impulsora d'un món digital especialment sensible a l'humanisme. Xarxa, futur, femení. Tres mots que projecten un horitzó de progrés tres característiques que substancien la UOC, tres elements que ens permetran identificar les bones idees, les idees puntuals, les idees precises, les idees transformadores. Doctora Hall, moltes gràcies per acceptar formar part de la nostra comunitat universitària. Moltes gràcies per acompanyar-nos.